right? And after tonight's talk, uh, we hope you'll join us for three additional talks in the series. So on February 10, we're going to have On the Edge of the Arctic by Barb and Whit Dahl, and that's going to be at the library at 6.30 that Monday evening. Next, we'll have Incredible India with Bill Dolger, and that will be here at the Senior Center on Wednesday, February 26th at 6 p.m. And then our final travel talk this season will be The Ruby Mines of Madagascar, 1999, presented by Ella Chapin at the library at 6.30 p.m. on Monday, March 16th. We've got flyers for this, along with some other information about the Senior Center here at the table. We've also got water, if anyone would like some, in the back corner there. If you need a restroom, there's a single stall around the orange corner there. And through the lobby and to the right, when you get toward the elevator, there are additional restrooms. Um, there's a fire exit in the back. There are a couple steps. Otherwise, exits to the front and the side will get you out. We're really thrilled to have Therese Majou and Peter Kelman here to share their adventures from China. China. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're just talking about China and Japan. I apologize. If you're here for China, I apologize. Okay, tonight we are going to Japan with Peter and Therese, and we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much. All right, you have to go get the lights. All right, there we go. All right, this will take 10 minutes of the talk right here, just doing this. How do you do this? I'm doing this totally wrong. Ah, there we go, okay. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Welcome, everyone, um, and thank you for coming. Here, you can have that, okay. Uh, thank you also to MSAC and to the Kellogg Hubbard Library for doing this great series and for inviting us. Um, Peter and I have a lot to cover tonight, and we want to make sure we can answer all your questions. So we're going to ask that you hold them until the end, and that way other people like Barbara Dahl and perhaps other people in the audience who have been to Japan can help us answer the questions since we are by no means Japanese experts. Um, and Peter's going to begin. <clears throat> uh, what we want to share with you tonight are our personal experiences and impressions of a country that is about as different from the United States as any advanced modern society could be. Um, as such, our presentation will neither be a travelogue of the greatest tourist hits of Japan, we went a lot of places we're not going to tell you about, uh, nor a chronologically organized slideshow of our trip. Um, instead, it's good, it's, uh, we're doing this around some topics. Uh, but before we get into the uh, subjective part, we thought there's some objective facts that you would be helpful for you to know. Most of these come from Wikipedia. And so this is, I'm calling this Japan by the numbers. I'm just going to tip this up a little bit. Um, Japan is an island nation. Actually, it's an archipelago of nearly 7,000 islands, five of which comprise the vast majority of the country's total area. Honshu, is the largest, most populated, and it's the only place that we went. Honshu is the home of Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, Hiroshima, uh, and among dozens of other large cities. And as such, it's probably what most Westerners think of when they say Japan. Approximately two thirds of Japan's terrain is mountainous and heavily forested. Less than an eighth of its land is suitable for agriculture. However, the Japanese appear to take advantage of every square inch of that arable land. So the visitor is left with the impression of far more agricultural activity than might be expected from that one eighth statistic. Japan's population is about 125 million, which is well less than half of the US population, although its total land mass 
is less than 5% of the U.S. Uh, uh, land area. So with so much of Japan's land being mountainous, forest, and devoted to agriculture, just 20% of it remains for living space. Consequently, Japan is among the most densely populated and urbanized countries in the world, with over 90% of its population living in urban areas. The last, whoops, sorry. Last fact is this. As for its economy, and this is an interesting point, despite Japan's lost two decades, it's 20 years of economic stagnation uh, in the 90s and in the or first decade of the 2000s, it remains the third largest national economy in the world after the US and China. We've organized our presentation into these five main topics. Japan's service economy and its idiosyncratic system of etiquette and social norms, what we call intimations of the sublime, beauty, and danger in Japan's natural and man-made landscape, close and persistent encounters with Japan's unique religious syncretism, the special aesthetics of the Japanese, their arts and entertainment, and our experiences with Japan's distinctive approaches to food and drink. We're going to be doing this in a slightly different order than we have here. <laughs> We're going to start with Japan's service economy and its idiosyncratic system of etiquette and social norms. Everywhere we went felt safe, clean, and accommodating, even in big cities. We saw little or no trash on sidewalks, streets, subways, and in other public spaces. And yet, very few trash con or right re containers or recycling containers anywhere, largely due to security concerns after the 1995 sarin subway attacks. As a result, on our first day, I found myself holding on to an empty takeout coffee cup for hours looking everywhere for a trash container. So how do they keep everything so clean without trash containers? Well, to begin with, according to Japanese etiquette, it's rude to eat uh, on tra public transportation or while walking in public, one thing at a time. So if you buy street food, you should eat it where you bought it and then throw away the trash in the vendor's trash container. Ditto for vending machines, which generally are accompanied by bottle and can recycling containers. Otherwise, most Japanese hold on to their wrappers and takeout containers, put them in their pockets and purses, until they return to their home recycling. But the main reason why Japan is so neat and clean are probably a combination of cultural values, a sort of wa of cleanliness, and the full employment legion of uniformed street sweepers, gardeners, and trash collectors employed to keep public spaces and buildings trash free. So much of Japan is about service. The service economy accounts for three quarters of its total economic output. And it seems as though every aspect of its service economy is designed to make life simpler and easier for its own citizens and for the increasing number of tourists coming to Japan, especially from other Asian countries and Australasia. So we're going to talk about the two service sectors we had the most direct experience with, transportation and accommodations. But this, gives to, this will give you a sense of how th this is executed efficiently and or in an organized way by an enormous number of incredibly polite and patient workers. First, let's consider uh, Japan's transportation system. It's trains, subways, and buses. The transportation system, as I'm sure you know, is incredibly efficient and always on time. In fact, we had before we left for Japan about a Japanese train company actually issuing a public apology because one of their trains departed 20 seconds early. 
This same on-time performance applies to buses, whether in large cities like Kyoto or small rural villages, all of them featuring onboard real-time video displays and audio announcements of routes and stops, usually in multiple languages, one of which is always English. Not just for Americans in English, but uh, you know, English is sort of the lingua franca of tourism. Platforms and waiting rooms are comfortable and provide vending machines. <laughs> Any number of the unique Japanese vending machines found absolutely everywhere in Japan, offering almost anything you might eat or drink and snacks of every conceivable or even inconceivable nature. And needless to say, in train and bus stations and en route, transportation personnel always seemed to be unruffled and helpful. Many were quite young and passably multilingual, and they were all polite to a fault. Just as an example, uh, you know, we knew, of course, about the Japanese custom of bowing, but it was a puzzle and a delight to watch the train conductors enter your car walk through it to the end, turn, and bow to the entire car every time they came in. Um, we don't have a picture of that because we thought it might be sort of rude to take, to take it. But we do have this picture of a sort of balletic uh, platform uh, 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 conductor. Uh, making sure that the trains run on time and that the passengers are loading properly. Uh, one feature of Japan's rail system that might at first seem out of character is the limited storage space provided for large luggage on their long distance uh, trains. However, this, even this feature seems to be designed for better customer service. It keeps the aisles clear, provides more space, space, more space for leg room and overall comfortable seating, and it limits the chaos of people lugging large bags on and off at train stops. So what do tourists do with their large luggage, you might ask? Not to worry. Japan offers a reliable, reasonably priced, convenient, and secure service which can be used to send luggage door to door nationwide, often with next day delivery. Called Taku Haibin, it is available in almost every hotel and all but the most remote of Japan's small rural inns. Well, hold on, I've got to find my page here. here. Sorry. Yeah, what'd you do with my pages? Okay, I'm missing five. No, 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 they're there. Okay, sorry. Hmm? Hmm? Five and six, okay, there we go. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about accommodation. I'm gonna talk about places we stayed, like this. This is a rural inn called a Ryokan. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. That's our best attempt. Anything we say here is our best attempt. Okay. Um, nearly all European style hotels in cities and traditional rural Japanese inns, ryokan, um, are exceptionally neat and clean, of course, including mandatory shoe removal and the wearing of indoor slippers, which are provided, and all of you Vermonters would feel very at home there. They also offer array, an array of room amenities like yakutas, which are a kind of lightweight cotton kimono, and they also give you instructions on how to tie them. Um, and it's actually very important that you wrap your yakuta the right way, because if you do it the incorrect way, one way is the correct way, and the other way is the way you do it at funerals. I mean, so you, have to be, you don't want to walk around like you're going to a funeral. And the thing is, it's very important actually to do it the right way, because once you are in an inn, you wear your yakuta everywhere, to the dining room, in the hallways, everywhere. You rarely see anybody in uh, street clothes in um, a country inn. In, the, in the, the European style hotels, the big hotels, you will see people walking around the street clothes, although you also will see people walking around in their yakutas. Okay. 
Okay, so now on to my favorite thing about Japanese accommodations, the bathrooms. The hotel bathrooms are have provide luxurious hand soaps, modern showers, and the incredible Japanese toilets, which deserve special mention. The seats are warm, and which is really nice in the middle of the night. And the toilets provide both bidet and rear end warm water cleaning. The one problem we encountered with Japanese toilets, which are ubiquitous in Japan, is that the, the controls sometimes are only in Japanese. And the, and the controls aren't necessarily the same from toilet to toilet. And I got into a big problem in the Tokyo train station once. <laughs> Um, and as I said, they are ubiquitous. These are, not a, these are available in nice hotels. We found one hiking on a mountainous trail. We found a Japanese toilet. Couldn't believe it. Okay, so in addition to having these wonderful toilets, the Japanese public restrooms are remarkably fa family friendly. You will find in many of them the following items. So this is a seat to hold your toddler so that you can pee. This is a wee size urinal in a wee size sink for the wee size peer. And that upper um, toilet seat is actually something you put down so the small bum can't fall through into the toilet. I mean, it's so family friendly, and why hasn't anyone in the United States ever thought of any of this? Okay. Finally, nearly all Ryev, Ryokan, and many tourist hotels also provide these glorious communal and sometimes private hot tubs called onsen, which, and they usually author, offer both indoor and outdoor facilities. And you're not allowed to take pictures inside the onsen, so I had to download these from the internet. Um, and this particular photo is totally misleading because they're gender separated. Uh, so you can see that man and woman together, they're totally, they're gender separated. But this photo, of uh, an outdoor one, is actually pretty representative of what the outdoor ones felt like and were like. They were just extraordinary. Um, in the Ryokan, where the onsen custom originated, the water comes from the natural, non-sulfuric, hot water springs of the area. Basically, Japan is one huge volcanic island, or set of islands. Um, and in the European-style hotels, the water is simply very hot, chlorinated city water. I did not take this photo. Uh, because the traditional onsen weren't chlorinated, they have very strict hygiene rules which have become part of the onsen etiquette even for modern communal baths that use chlorinated water. Thus, every person is expected to wash themselves thoroughly before entering the bath. And they, you sit on these low stools and um, at very low sinks, and they're equipped with scrub brushes and soap and hand showers. And my first time in onsen, I was so nervous. I was so afraid of violating some rule that I just watched for quite a while what the Japanese women were doing and then just did what they did, which basically means you scrub every single inch of your body. And this is... It seemed to us that a key to understanding why the Japanese are so good at providing services, like those that we just described and more, might be the idiosyncratic Japanese rules and social norms that regulate nearly all of their personal interactions. Some of these rules may have clear, practical, primarily health rationales. For example, Japanese people are expected to work even when they have colds. So they have rules about wearing masks and not blowing one's nose in public. Other Japanese social conventions are more like what Westerners might consider to be modern uh, uh, good manners or simple consideration for others. For example, some of these sound pretty good to me, no loud phone conversations in public places not raising your voice in anger or frustration in public or in front porch forum. Um, <clears throat> still other aspects of Japanese etiquette may seem odd and inexplicable to Westerners, such as using both hands when giving and receiving things, including exchanging business cards. Don't point while speaking. Don't leave a tip at your table. It's rude. 
place money on the small tray next to the cash register rather than handing it directly to the cashier. Now, some of these rules of etiquette may seem extreme or arcane to us, but they are part of a Japanese culture that has been evolving for more than 2,000 years. And despite greatly increased Western influences, Japan has retained its distinct and substantially different cultural values and social etiquette. So in closing on this topic, uh, we both thought it was important to say that although we encountered a certain formality governing our interactions with Japanese people, we also experienced a genuine friendliness among the people we encountered along the way. For example, these two men, trail guides, we met on a train. They spoke a little English, more English than my, I spoke Japanese, and we had a friendly cultural exchange for a half hour or so during which they told us that they actually lived in the town we'd be walking through on the next day of our hike. And lo and behold, on the next day, just as we were about to head out of that town onto one of the hardest sections of the trail, there they were, waving us down, provisioning us with delicious Japanese snacks, and reassuring us that we could handle the challenge ahead. Pure friendliness. We also experienced exceptional kindness and generosity from Taka, our guide in Hiroshima, who delighted in conversation with us, brought us to her home. We, she wasn't paid to do that. Treated us to an abbreviated Japanese tea ceremony. A real one takes half a day. And then totally unexpectedly, dressed Therese in one of her, Taka's, exquisite antique kimonos. And a special mention of our, uh, of our in-host at Miyajima, which is an ancient sacred island in Hiroshima Bay, who saved us from making a terrible social faux pas with Taka. I'm going to let Therese tell the story, which is a great anecdote about both Japanese etiquette and Japanese kindness. So we knew, or we were told, that it was, ex it was acceptable to give your guide a tip, but preferably with brand new crisp notes, and it had to be in an envelope. So I went to a store, and I bought what I thought were envelopes for giving money, because on it, there's like this nice little illustration that shows money goes in it. So I bought this pretty purple, black, and black envelope. But I also had learned that you're supposed to tie these things with a ribbon, and we'll learn a little bit more about that in just a bit. So I asked our Miyajima in proprietor if she had one. She looked at my envelope and went, oh, no! <laughs> that envelope is for when somebody dies. <laughs> So she gave me the proper and probably very expensive envelope. It was decorated with this gorgeous red ribbon, the color of which denotes thank you. And it, I just couldn't have been um, more pleased that she saved me from that terrible embarrassment. But uh, her kindness was just, uh, and, but the, all, the other thing was is that she thought it was funny. So it wasn't like I had offended anybody, which was nice. Um, what I'm going to do here, oh, Peter's going to change the slides. But I'm going to uh, segue into um, our experiences with food in Japan which of course is one of the reasons why you go to Japan, is you go there to eat the food. We found the food to be exquisitely prepared. Are you gonna hit the play, honey? Oh, sorry. There we go. We found it to be, to be exquisitely prepared and presented, inventive, subtly flavored. It was, it's not spicy like other Asian foods. And so this evening, I'm just gonna walk you through some of the highlights of our food trip. So this was one of 13 dishes that we ate in a meal called the kaiseki, which is a many course meals, anywhere from 11 to 13 courses, served in some of the ryokans in which we stayed and at special restaurants in cities. It is the embodiment of Japanese food preparation and presentation. The first time we were served kaiseki was at the inn in which we stayed on Miyajima. And we couldn't figure out why she was giving, why she first didn't give us a menu. I mean, there were some people there who were not staying at the inn who had menus. 
and why she just kept bringing us dish after dish after dish until we were just stuffed. So the next night, we almost didn't go back because we were so <laughs> like, oh no, but we did. But we told her we just didn't want so much food. And I'm sure it was much to her dismay, and I'm afraid we might even have insulted her a little bit. Because it wasn't until we checked out of the hotel, out of the inn, that we realized our reservation had in fact included a kaiseki meal with each evening. So the next time we had kaiseki, we were ready for it, which took place at a remote mountain ryokan. Um, and it was served in our room by the lovely young woman named Miwa, who giggled at everything Peter said. And I'm not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> she thought he was a riot. Um, we sat or knelt or whatever you call that Western challenged posture at a very low table, which Miwa had set up for us. She also set up our sleeping futons while we were in the onsen. Uh, we felt as if we had been transported back in time to a scene out of the movie Shogun. And after our talk, you can take, look, take a look at the kaiseki menu. Um, but there's actually a couple of menus there, which was in English and in Japanese. And then another kaiseki meal we had relates to an important Japanese food, beef. You may have heard of Waigyu beef, which relates to any of four special breeds of Japanese cattle, the most expensive and famous being Kobe, which we did not have while we were there. But for a week of our trip, we were joined by Peter's daughter and her family who were living in Shanghai at the time, and they came over for the kids' spring break. And with them, we enjoyed a Waigu beef kaiseki, 11 courses mostly involving beef, and it was called yakuniku style, meaning we cooked several of the courses ourselves on a grill that you can see in the middle of the table. I will also point out here that we all look very comfortable because we are not sitting on the floor, but we're sort of in a kind of pit and our feet are, our legs are dangling, which is clearly an accommodation for Westerners. Although we did meet Japanese people who told us that they don't really like sitting at the low tables either. So you would think that all those courses would be beef overload. Well, maybe my grandson did. Um, but the truth is, is that each of the courses was so inventive and delicate, and I should add, served in small portions you never were eating a ton in any particular course, and even the baby loved it. Of course, she was born in Shanghai, so she's used to Asian food. Beef is also served in the form of sushi, um, and it's quite popular as a street food. In Takayama, we ate sushi from a street vendor that was made with a, beef, a breed of Ch uh, Japanese beef called Hida. Um, which is named for the Alpine region in which it was raised. And I have to say it was mind blowing. I'd never tasted anything like that in my life. And that is raw, that is raw, and it's incredibly tender and flavorful. Street food can be found in any reasonably sized city. And one of the most common street foods are takoyaki, or octopus balls, which are not the testicles of the octopus, but minced octopus meat battered and cooked in specially molded pans. Very delicious, very delicious. And another big street food is yakitori, which is essentially grilled meat on a stick. It's usually chicken, but sometimes beef or pork. But my favorite street food in Japan is the ice cream. It's soft serve ice cream. And I, you know, I'm not a big soft serve fan. I, you know, creamies, I can take them or leave them. But this soft serve is outstanding. I think it's because they use real cream and lots of it. And the flavors, green tea, I, I think that was my favorite. Black sesame, strawberry, and me, it really tastes like strawberry. Uh, cherry, chocolate, and I'm eating mango here. It has actual mango bits in it. And then a great place to eat in Japan are the food markets. Um, Kanazawa on the northwest, on the coastline north. How helpful is that? Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Where does this go? Here? Yeah. OK. Um, is uh, famous for his fish market. Anthony Bourdain actually did a show there. Um, and we, wait, we ate our way through the market. Oysters, eel liver, eel liver, mackerel, crayfish, tuna, octopus, and strawberries. Strawberries are everywhere in Japan. The fish markets in Japan were one of the outstanding places to get sushi, which in Japan is unlike any sushi we have ever had here in the States. It tastes so fresh, the texture is luxurious, and the ways they present it are true works of art. But sushi is actually both a high and low food art form in Japan. Our first night in Japan, we stumbled, we were incredibly jet lagged into, upon a sushi train restaurant. 
in which the dishes are color coded by price and they go by you on a conveyor belt and you pull off the ones that you want and then they calculate the bill at the end by counting your dishes. We also ate at one very high end sushi place in Kanazawa where there were only eight stools at the sushi bar and the proprietor kept coming over and correcting my chopstick form. I mean, she also was correcting other things too. She just kept correcting me, but it was it was very. I mean, I did. I, I wasn't offended at all. I thought it was very funny. It's sort of all part of the cultural experience. And I don't know why she didn't correct Peter because here he is using really incorrect chopstick etiquette. Um, we're eating yakiniku style. This is a different restaurant. And um, when you um, are not using your chopsticks, you're supposed to use your chopstick holder, and he's not doing that. <laughs> okay. Uh, some other chopstick etiquette uh, that, and, and general eating etiquette includes never ever stick your stop chopsticks vertically in your rice bowl, which can only be done at funerals. Don't cross your chopstick, which is also a symbol associated with death. Use the other end of the chopsticks to take food from a common dish. We learned that from Barbara Dahl. Thank you very much before we came here, went there. Um, don't play with your chopsticks or rub them together. Don't overuse the soy sauce with your sushi and be sure to use the correct sauce for the correct food. And I actually think that was one of the things that Madam Sushi Etiquette was trying to tell me. Um, don't pour your own drink and only pour the drink of your companion. I swear we violated that one every time. Okay. So Japan is not without its food oddities. A case in point, this is fake food. Restaurants and store windows are full of these weird, unappetizing reproductions of Japanese food. As strange as they are, there's actually a good reason for them. Many of the restaurant workers, especially in the countryside and smaller cities, don't speak other languages. But thanks to fake food, foreign tourists can literally point in the window to the dish they want. And as an example of the quirky side of the Japanese aesthetic, which I'll talk to you about a little bit later, you can find stores in Japanese that sell every variety of fake food, including fake beer and fake wine. So okonomiyaki is another quintessentially Japanese food. It's a kind of pancake which can be found almost everywhere in the country. On the street, in dedicated okonomiyaki diner type restaurants, and in do-it-yourself okonomiyaki restaurants. So Hiroshima lays claim to be the original okonomiyaki style. In this rendering, the ingredients are cooked in layers on the grill. Battered cabbage, eggs, pork belly, green onions, and a special sauce which is essentially Japanese mayonnaise. And despite their ungainliness, they are really delicious. In Hiroshima, we sat at the grill. I was sitting right on the other side of the grill there and watched our pancakes being made by this cook while Peter and he talked baseball, translated by Taka, our lovely guide. On our last night in, in Japan, we went to a do-it-yourself okonomiyaki restaurant where Peter played chef making an Osaka style, which is where all the ingredients are combined in one batter. And the waiter was extremely impressed with Peter's flipping skills. And Peter was so inspired by the experience that he was determined to have a Japanese dinner when we returned home. So with the help of Barbara and Whit Dahl and Peter's brother, who's pictured here, um, we and his, and his sister-in-law, we served and ate an 11 of course kaisaki menu that included non-traditionally Peter's delicious okonomiyaki, and he is available for catering. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's a picture of our table setting, which we tried very hard to recreate the Japanese aesthetic. And here's the menu. You'll look at it later. Yeah, yeah, yeah the menu there. Okay. So, next one. I can. All right, let you do that. I'll do it, then you get what you want. Okay. The sublime in the landscape of Japan. Shoguns, samurai, and the atomic bomb. Japan embodies the poetic idea of the sublime awe-inspiring nature that is so powerful and beyond human comprehension that it can be terrifying. As we traveled through Japan by train, bus, and on foot, we were often astonished by its beauty and impressed by the ingenious 
and mostly respectful, respectful ways in which the Japanese have carved out of that rugged landscape usable space. Our, 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 our journey really began on this high-speed Shinkansen bullet train from Tokyo, which first ran along the southeastern coast of Japan through the Kanto Plain, the large flat area all around Tokyo, 38 million people in that area. Uh, very heavily populated and impressively, <laughs> very impressively industrialized. Although at one point, I looked inland and I could catch a glimpse of the iconic and breathtaking Mount Fuji in the distance. Just, there's this industrialized area, there's Mount Fuji. Rising high above the Kanto Plain. In Nagoya, we transferred to a somewhat slower wide view train for a truly scenic trip to Takayama. We passed into a flat, sparsely populated, heavily cultivated agricultural area, followed by a gently, slope, gently sloping hills covered with thick tree plantations. Lumbering is very big in Japan. And then, surrounded on three sides, the Hida range of the Japanese Alps, which before we knew it, our train was climbing up into winding around and occasionally passing through via tunnels until we emerged on a broad plateau surrounded by snow-patched mountains, the alpine city of Takayama, now the largest Japanese city by area, not by population, and a tourist destination for Japanese and other mostly non-American tourists. Takayama was founded as a castle fortress town in the late 16th century, toward the end of the Japanese Warring States period, which some of you may be acquainted with from Japanese samurai movies. This was a, a sculpture of a Japanese samurai warlord in that area. I want to just give you a few kind of important facts historical facts, which I think will help you when you see some of the rest of what we saw in today's Japan. And there's a history fact sheet on your, on your uh, uh, chair for you to look at later, but this is a short, very short version of it. The history of Japan is unique among nations in that it was ruled nearly continuously for 675 years, from the late tw uh, 12th to the late 19th century, by its military class. Headed up by the shogun, who was a feudal military dictator, and the samurai, who were feudal military nobility and officers. The shogun held power over his large territory through hundreds of local and regional feudal landowners called daimyo, who were the equivalent of medieval European lords. The daimyo, in turn, commanded the samurai, whose principal loyalty, however, was actually to the shogun. So if you've read James Clavell's novel Shogun or seen the miniseries, this entire arrangement probably sounds familiar to you. That's the end of the history lesson, but you're going to see why I gave it to you in a little bit. So back to Takayama, where we spent a day and a half Oh, sorry, there's a, that's a shogun. Um, it's an actual antique shogun. No, samurai. Uh, I'm sorry, samurai uh, outfit. We spent a day, yeah, and a half, basically walking around the incredible, picturesque, and surprisingly peaceful old town. A lot of tourists, but it just seemed to absorb and get the tourists just got calmer and calmer the longer they were there. We certainly did with its tastefully flood-controlled river running right through it, crisscrossed by a variety of artful wooden bridges, flowing past streets of well-preserved samurai-era buildings, and riverside vendors offering a variety of delicious and often surprising street food. The, the highlight 
of our time in Takayama was a leisurely three mile walk we took above the old town, which uh, from one end of the old town to the other, a meandering path past majestic trees filled with unfamiliar bird song, diverting at various points up into expansive Shinto shrines and burial grounds, and past 13 Buddhist temples. These were the first of many Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines we were to encounter, often side by side, during our travels in Japan. And at this point, if we hadn't read the signs on each, we wouldn't have known which were shrines and which were temples. Our trip through the Alps concluded with a spectacular bus ride from Takayama to the western coastal city of Kanazawa, in which our bus wound its way through densely forested mountains on brilliantly engineered highways, passing over long bridges and through even longer tunnels, occasionally to emerge in a small, modestly populated valley, like the one containing the reconstructed traditional Hida village of Shirakawa with its uh, grass sod roofs. Takayama was one of our first experience with the dramatic landscape in J of Japan. Now let's jump to our last such experience. Our five-day self-guided walk on the carefully preserved remnants of the Nakasendo, a long-distance trail that linked the imperial capital of Kyoto at that time with the political capital of Edo, which is present-day Tokyo during the Edo period in the 17th century to the middle of the 18th, 19th century. Sorry, yeah, 18th century. No, 19th. 19th century, <laughs> sorry. 1603 to 1868, okay. A remarkable 250 years of relative peace in Japan in striking contrast to the Western world, which was in a state of nearly constant warfare during that very same time. Today's Nakasendo, like the original, meanders through forests, over mountain paths, and into villages, some of which feature buildings that have been preserved and or rebuilt in Edo period style. The original Nakasendo was one of the five major routes connecting Edo with the rest of the country that was established by the first of the Tokugawa shoguns during this time. In order to ensure that the hundreds of his daimyo would spend alternate years in Edo and in their own domains, leaving their wives to live full time in Edo as hostages. When the daimyo and their retinues made their biennial journeys, to and from Edo, from as far away as Nagasaki, 600 miles to the southwest of Tokyo, their journey could last as long as six months. We spent five days walking our 33 miles of the Nakasendo, an average of about seven walking day, uh, miles per day. On day one, we hiked up through the Magomi Togi Pass, the first of three mountain passes we would cross on our five-day walk. The steep and winding path up is one of the most challenging parts of the Nakasendo, and it made clear to us why the daimyo and their retinue traveled largely on foot or were carried in palanquins by porters. Riding horses would have been just too dangerous. We passed the remnants of the lives and habits of 17th century Japan all along the route, indicating everything from worship to work. Our three hour, five mile walk ended in Sumago, one of the 69 historic post towns along the Nakasendo, and among the first to be preserved during the 20th century by its townspeople who established three basic rules. Do not sell, lend, or demolish houses. This 
Day two, this day's hike was quite long, 12 miles, six hours, but it was spectacular, as you can see. However, over the past 150 years, much of the original Nakasendo has been replaced by highways, large towns, and even small cities. In this photo, if you, if you, could, if you look closely, you would notice signs of modern life all along the Nakasendo, towns, electric towers, and bridges. Uh, also, passing roads, infrastructure, this is a dam, and industry, lumber. But the Nakasendo is always dominated by the sublime natural beauty of the area. On some days, like this one, we necessarily walked segments of the trail with connections between them provided by train, bus, or Ryokan van. But when we were on the trail, it was as if we had entered a different world. Shrines, statues. On day three, we have had a relatively short walk, four miles, three hours although it included our highest elevation at the Tori Toge Pass, another one of the most difficult parts of the Nakasendo. This is looking down from the pass. Along the day way, we repeatedly passed and were repassed by a gregarious group of young Singaporeans who greatly admired our senior stamina. <laughs> and they took the best picture uh, we have of the two of us on our trip. At the highest point on the walk, we encountered an ancient Shinto shrine replete with statuary. Our destination on this day was Narai, once known as Narai of 1,000 Inns, the most prosperous of the original Nakasendo post towns. During the Edo period, the daimyo and their retinue prepared or recovered here in the many specially built inns before or after tackling the steep Tori Togi Pass that we just had gone through. Make a mental note of this Narai Cemetery. You're going to see it again in a moment in a very different state. On day four, we woke up to snow, which we certainly were not expecting. Remember the cemetery from yesterday? We took a snowy but short one-hour walk to Kiso Hirasawa, the lacquerware center of Japan. We spent some time in lacquerware shops admiring the very special work done there. We bought a few small, light, affordable items, which you can look at over on the table afterwards. And we caught a late morning train that brought us to Karuizawa. I never can, can say that one right an upscale Stowe or maybe even Aspen-like town, which apparently has been bought up by Bill Gates and other wealthy tech magnates. Whoop. There, sorry. Uh, it actually snowed most of the day, so we were just as happy that we weren't walking on the trail. We did, however, walk a mile or so in pretty heavy snow from the train station to our accommodations that evening. We spent that night at a venerable Ryokan, which has a 400-year history, including carpeting and armchairs from the late 19th century. Day five, our last day on the Nakasendo, was a true adventure. Although the snow had stopped falling at some point overnight, there was nearly a foot of accumulation. But being the intrepid Vermonters, we set off through the snow. I was wearing supposedly water-resistant sneakers. The 10.5-mile, six-hour hike was on a relatively narrow forest trail that began by going up to and over another pass, and then down what is reputed to be, quote, one of the most beautiful sections of the Nakasendo, and certainly the least developed. Along the way were sites of battles from the Warring States period, which had been brought to an end by the emergence of the Edo Shogun, ruins of Edo-era 
tea houses, and way stations, including Sekisho, which were checkpoints established along the route to prevent hostage-bound wives from escaping and guns from being smuggled into Edo by the daimyos for possible insurrection, as well as countless small shrines and memorials from ancient to modern times. And of course, views of the surrounding forests and the sublime jagged mountain peaks towering over the small city of Yokokawa. It was all spectacularly beautiful and serenely quiet, just us and the chickadees on the trail. I guess no one else was crazy enough to attempt this in the relatively deep snow. After six hours, we arrived in Yokokawa. Our feet soaked and cold, but we were really glad we'd done this. <coughs> Along with buried, bloody battlefields of the past, even more terrible sources of danger have long lurked behind the sublime natural beauty of Japan. Ever since prehistoric times, Japan has experienced an average of three major earthquakes and tsunamis per century. And much more recently, and much more recently, while continuously bombing Tokyo over a three hour period, I want you to actually listen to this very carefully, during World War II, the United States on a single day in the spring of 1945, unleashed a deliberate and devastating firebombing that destroyed 16 square miles of central Tokyo, left more than 100,000 civilians dead and over 1 million homeless, making it the single deadliest air raid of World War II, more than Dresden, more than Hiroshima, more than Nagasaki. And finally, Japan is the only country in the world to have ever suffered the devastation of an atomic bomb attack. On August 6th and 9th, 1945, the United States detonated two such awesomely destructive weapons, one each over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing more than 200,000, most of whom were civilians. But such numbers can't in any way convey the horror and tragedy of these events. That requires a visit to Hiroshima. The A-bomb dome in this picture is what remained of a civic building at the epicenter of the atomic explosion. The city decided to keep it as a reminder of the nuclear devastation. The Peace Memorial Park where one can actually feel the loss of so many lives and offer up hopes for peace, which many people do by placing origami at the Children's Peace Monument. And finally, oh, sorry, one must visit the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum to see and feel the pathos of the thousands of photographs, film clips, and artifacts of the bombings exhibited. Photographs of A-bomb survivors suffering from burns and other injuries. Deformed and melted everyday objects like a watch stopped at 8.15 a.m. and a child's tricycle. A photograph of a human shadow etched in stone by the blast. The belongings of now dead junior high students. A final diary entry a white wall stained by the black rain of the blast, and perhaps no photograph as poignant as this one. To us, this was the saddest picture of the museum. Children from a local school, all were killed. We should add that our visit was greatly enriched by our having a guide who was born just four days after the A-bomb explosion and whose life was significantly affected by the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. The remarkable thing about visiting Hiroshima is to understand that the people of Japan do not seem to place blame for the tragedy that struck their country. 
Instead, they want to continually remind the people and the leaders of the world of the dangers posed by war and by nuclear weapons. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about um, Japanese aesthetics, their art, and their entertainment. Um, the Japanese are justifiably known for their appreciation and expression of beauty. There are many examples of Japanese fine art, from calligraphy, which originated with the Chinese. The Japanese language is actually based on Chinese, but became an art form in and of itself in the Edo period, and also through the rise of Buddhism. Buddhism also generated other important Japanese art forms like sculpture and paintings. Uh, scenes like this of the imperial court were influenced by the adoption of Buddhism by the emperor in the ninth century. Eventually paintings, along with screens, sliding doors, walls, became more decorative and less religious during the Edo period, the 1600s, starting in the 1600s, and it captured scenes like this, which looks like a sort of field hockey game. And then the tea ceremony, which is an art form in and of itself, gave rise to the art of scrolls. In every tea ceremony room, you will see scrolls, and they change them out depending on sort of, I guess, the mood or something they want to. I'm not sure exactly why they change them out. Anyway, um, it, tea ceremonies also gave rise to lacquerware and ceramics. But as I mentioned earlier, the Japanese also have a very quirky aesthetic that brought the world Hello Kitty. and strange street characters like these. <laughs> but, what, but what perhaps interested me the most was, that, was the Japanese art that could be found outside museums, the evidence of artistic effort and sensibility everywhere we met. And I'm going to start with something ut entirely utilitarian, made into a work of art, what I might call quotidian or everyday art, and that's a manhole cover. Every town and city in Japan has its own manhole cover design, each one distinct, elaborate, and beautiful. This one is from the town of Nara, and it incorporates the deer, you can see it over on the left, um, which they can consider to be sacred and which roam freely around sections of the city, as you can see here with my granddaughter, who is feeding one in the park. Ordinary Japanese people take part in their own decorative arts efforts, which can include most famously origami. This is a photo of a display case in our Hiroshima guide Taka's house, containing her own origami work. She, she, she studied it, and, um, and she's one of many, many everyday Japanese people who, who, who have learned how to do this um, as, as an art form. She gave us several people, pieces, excuse me, as did ran, set random people on the street who just give away their origami, and some of which we have here on the table here for you to look at later. Taka also participates in another unique Japanese popular art form of doll making. This is a display case in her house. Um, the dolls in this photo are elaborate renderings of imperial court figures, mostly emperors and empresses, some musicians. Um, we saw these in her house, and we saw and we came upon these kind of dolls in two other locations because Japan has a national doll festival every March in which people from local towns make these dolls. So we saw them on Miyajima, and we also saw them in kan uh, Kanazawa. They're just remarkable. Another quotidian and very popular Japanese art form is the art of ribbon making and gift wrapping. So this is a display of wrapping for wedding gifts. It was a, in a small local museum uh, in Kanazawa, and this, these were made by local people. Um, they're basically ribbons that are made specifically for wedding gifts, and I'll give you a close-up of one of them. Those are two fish ribbons. Um, in the form of koi or carp, 
which is a symbol for prosperity and happiness, which is, seems appropriate for a wedding gift. Um, and then another of, um, well-known form of Japanese art are its gardens, um, which are everywhere as part of temples and shrines, museums, public parks, and also private homes. There are different kinds of gardens, Japanese gardens, including tea gardens like this one here, uh, which incorporates tea houses and shelters. Uh, this is in the Hamariku Garden in Tokyo, and it's also a great example of urban uh, Japanese garden art, I mean, the way they just sort of nestle these gardens in in the middle of these incredible high, um, skyscrapers. And what I'm just gonna do right now is just sort of walk you through just some of the really beautiful gardens that we strolled through uh, during our time in J Japan with no real commentary, just let's just see them. That's Hamariku also. This is actually, a, I can't remember the name of it, but it's the famous bamboo forest in Kyoto. And since we were in Japan during Sakura, or cherry blossom time, I would be remiss if I didn't show you some of the gorgeous cherry blossoms we saw, which truly are their own silviculture art form. That's Philosopher's Path in Kyoto. That's the river in Kyoto. That's, a, that, that's actually a plum tree. And there's two beautiful blossoms. That's my granddaughter. Quite by happenstance, we literally followed the cherry blossoms throughout our entire time in Japan. By the time we got to Tokyo, they were on the wane, but they were still magnificent. Another unique Japanese art form is the kimono. That's actually the back of the kimono that um, Taka put on me. Um, which are, they only started being actually called kimonos in the 19th century, but they were worn as early as the 8th century simple everyday garments. But it was during the Edo period, starting around 1600, when the kosodo, as it was then called, became a unifying cultural marker. Every Japanese person wore it, regardless of age, gender, or socioeconomic position. Although, as you can imagine, the kimonos of the elite classes were substantially more elaborate than those of the working classes. And here are a few historic kimonos on display in the Tokyo National Museum. It's just a few. Kimonos now are a bit of a cultural relic. Taka, who owned oh, at least a half a dozen exquisite, mostly antique kimonos, they, some of them from her mother, her grandmother, told us that her daughter-in-law has no interest in them whatsoever. Some people get married in kimonos, although they're just as likely to get married in Western white brides wear and modern tuxedos. But one place we saw kimonos being worn, and this is another example of Japan's quirky, kitschy side, is on the streets, donned by tourists, mostly Japanese, I mean, excuse me, Chinese, although not exclusively, who rent them to walk around in them for the day. And the rental is also apparently the thing to do for Japanese graduating seniors, whom we saw everywhere in Kyoto one of the days that we were there, both boys and girls outfitted. Another place you can see kimonos is in Kabuki Theater. One of Japan's oldest and most celebrated kinds of performance art, Kabuki developed in Kyoto in the early 17th century, and it incorporates dance, dramatic gestures, and music. Kabuki involves complex plot lines with dramas centering around court, family, and military intrigues, and elaborate costumes to match the drama. And this is me outside the theater. I was not allowed to take any pictures inside the theater, so these are downloaded from the internet. Uh, we attended a, uh, a kabuki performance, and actually what we really attended was just like a tiny bit of it, because the kabuki performances go all day long. But they have the balcony set up for tourists, basically, so that we can come in and watch it for an hour or so. Um, but down on the orchestra, these people go in and they go all day to watch these, these performances. Um, it was really one of the strangest theater experiences we've ever had. Um, the actors come on stage, they find their places, and then they pose, and they say their lines, and they rarely ever move from those original positions. And it made it very hard for us to infer the plot, because of course it was in Japanese, and there was so little action, we couldn't get any clues. All the actors are men, and the, uh, the men who play female roles are called onagata. 
Uh, this is a poster offering a biography of one of the celebrated Onagata. Um, the actor's vocalizations do not resemble normal human speech, and I mean Japanese human speech, not Western. They change pitch and octave levels in mid-sentence, and some audience members shout out loud at various times, usually when an actor strikes a particularly dramatic pose. And what we learn later is that they were shouting the stage name of the actor, or if they really wanted to pay a compliment, they were, they were shouting the actor's father's stage name, because kabuki actors tend to be generational. It was truly a spectacle, unlike any other dramatic art we've ever seen. Of course, another big performance art in Japan are the movies. And this one, uh, and, and one of the, and the Japanese movie was, was responsible for getting us to Japan, at least in part. In 2018, we took a MSEC film class with Rick Winston on post-war Japanese movies, and it really inspired me in particular to want to visit rural Japan. But even before that, we'd been big fans of Japanese film director Akira Kurosawa, especially his samurai movies. Now, those last two slides that I just showed you were taken at a Japanese film museum that was housed within the movie studio Toei, where many samurai genre films were and still are made. In that place, you can walk among the samurai era sets and feel like Toshiro Mufuni is going to jump out at you from one of the doorways. The studio was also an amusement park of sorts for, um, for kids, and our grandson got to learn some ninja warrior techniques. I think it is safe to say that baseball is a popular art form in Japan. We went to the famous Tokyo Dome to see the Yumiuri Giants play and experienced how Japanese baseball games are a universe unto themselves. Japanese fans, baseball fans, are truly fan addicts. They have individual songs that they sing for each player. They bring their own marching bands to the stadium but of course, they're incredibly polite. They don't boo, they don't harass the other teams, and they're very loyal. And here is a picture of a typical fan. Okay. Now, did I mention that they are incredibly loud? I don't know if you caught a glimpse of that young woman just at the very, very end. She is an example of what we found to be the strangest aspect of Japanese ball games, the Eureka. Pretty young girls who carry 30 plus pound kegs of draft beer or other drinks on their backs and run, and I mean run, up and down the stadium steps, smiling maniacally, waving their hands geisha style, and then whipping out the spouts and the cups when someone flags them down. We have never seen anything like it. All right, there's one Japanese entertainment that is impossible, impossible to avoid, and I guess you could say it's its own art form, and that's shopping. I'm going to give you just two examples so you can see the gamut of Japanese store shopping from the ridiculous to the sublime. Now this is, oh god, I'm never going to pronounce this correctly, Ameyayo Kocho, which is basically a warren of city streets with discount stores. We went on a Sunday and it was mobbed. Um, and these stores can go many stories high and have funny little architecture to go with it. Okay, now to the sublime, which in its own way is also ridiculous. Mitsukoshi is, well, first of all, I had agreed to get Peter to go to it. He did not want to do this. It's called the Herods of Japan. It's the oldest department store in Asia. It started out as a kimono seller in the 1600s. We arrived at the main door, which is outfitted with two lions. Let's see if I can, there we go. Um, worthy of the New York City Public Library and time for opening hour. When the store is open for the day, several employees, I'll just go back there and show you, several employees come out to the grand entrance and read a formal greeting to the customers waiting to enter, and then they bow. Then, as you enter the store, a, another group of employees are lined up and bow to you as you walk through. It's utterly charming. The store is 
a study in tasteful ostentation, if that makes any sense. I found the ceilings, lighting, wall treatments, elevator, and stairways over the top, and yet awe-inspiring. Um, here's a picture they took of us in front of this enormous blown glass sculpture. We went up to the floor that sold kimonos, some of them costing more than $10,000. Everything in the store is very expensive. But through my persistence, we found something we could afford. We bought a sake pitcher and two cups made by Kihara, which is a 400-year-old Japanese porcelain producer, for only $37. It definitely had to have been the cheapest thing in the store. Then we went down to the food court. <laughs> which was the most enticing food court I have ever been in, in my, we've ever been in. We bought pastries and coffee and a beef sushi snack for later. That store, I have to say, was truly a highlight of our stay in Tokyo. All right. I'm gonna cut this one a little short so that we give you time to ask questions. Sorry about that. <clears throat> they, they were everywhere we went, the Shinto shrines and the Buddhist temples. From the largest cities like Kyoto and Tokyo to the smallest villages in parks, forests, and fields, or simply tucked into an urban neighborhood. From the Shinto shrines deep in the sacred mountains of the Ki Peninsula, to the enormous statue of the Buddha in the ancient imperial capital of Nara. Literally everywhere and anywhere we went in Japan, there they were. In fact, there are around 80,000 public Shinto shrines and more than 77,000 Buddhist temples in Japan. And they're often found together, relatively modest Buddhist temples sitting within large, expansive Shinto shrines featuring dozens, if not hundreds, of vermilion tori, or fierce Shinto deities ornamenting otherwise simple Buddhist temples, where one can observe the Shinto-influenced ways which many Japanese seem to embrace their Buddhism. Welcome to what is certainly the oldest and one of the most fascinating examples of religious syncretism in the world. I'm going to skip the next bit. So let's go to Miyajima. Okay. Is this Keep going. Okay, okay. There we go. Miyajima. Okay. So uh, I think you you may remember that Peter talking about the fact that it wasn't clear to us what was a shrine and what was a temple. It all became clear on Miyajima. This is a large island on Hiroshima Bay. It's just a five minute ferry ride from the mainland, but a world away from 21st century life. This photo shows Miyajima's Mount Mizen, which has been considered a sacred, and a sacred object of worship since the ancient times. We had read a bit about Miyajima, literally Shrine Island and its UNESCO World Heritage, Itsukushima Shrine, but nothing could have prepared us for the vision of its gigantic vermilion Tory gate standing in the sea guarding the island, or the beautiful but frankly bizarre Baisho Inn Buddhist temple on the grounds of the Shinto shrine. That's Peter with one of the pe peculiar Shinto guardians on the Daisho Inn temple. You can figure out which one Peter is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a, Tory, a Tory gate has been welcoming and guarding the island since the 12th century. The present one, known as O Tori, is nearly 55 feet high and more than 80 feet wide. It's the eighth such Tory to be in this location since the ninth century. This one was built in 1875 out of Japanese camphor and cedar trees, and it is still standing 150 years later. It stands under its own weight of 60 tons. The entire island of Miyajima is the precinct of the shrine, and it is believed that the gods actually reside in the island, making it an object of veneration. For centuries, the island was considered to be so sacred that commoners were only allowed to pass to approach it through, by steering their boats through the Tory Gate to purify them. To this day, births and deaths are not allowed on, near the shrine, and there is no burial site on the island. Pregnant women are supposed to leave the island to give birth, and people who are terminally, terminally ill must be removed from the island as well. 
The entire Itsukushima shrine is dedicated to Shinto gods and goddesses of sea and storms. There we go. There we go. The multi-billion shrine suspended over the water, multi-building shrine, excuse me, suspended over the water is graceful and beautiful. And you can see this is low tide, but the water at high tide comes in underneath the shrine. The Daisho Inn, Buddhist temple, which is located within the shrine precinct, is without a doubt the craziest religious building we have ever visited. This is a walk up to the temple, and you pass hundreds of these adorable little statues of a bodhisattva, which is a Buddhist saint, called Jizu Bosatu. There, there's more there. These are quite different from the regular Jizo images. Um, which are usually just shown as regular Buddhist monks. Here, the Jizu Bozatu are wearing knit caps like babies, which are made by parents who have lost their children. They believe that if they take good care of the Jizu images, they will be taking good care of their lost children. The temple building is relatively modest compared to what's inside, which is thousands of small statues of bodhisattvas and protectors. People also put bibs on the religious statuary to signify the care of children who have died. You can see bib religious statues all over Japan, not only in shrines, but along roadsides and even in people's gardens. So I, I think we're gonna just close, and so there is some time for asking questions. I want, just wanna close with this final observation. Um, our conclusion about 21st century Japanese syncretism is, that Buddhism, particularly Zen Buddhism, is seriously waning in, in Japan because as in most economically advanced countries, many people just don't have the time or psychic energy to spend in serious religious practice, whether it be Zen Buddhism or monastic Christianity. But on our visits, we observed a genuine devotion among Japanese, both tourists and locals, I'm gonna see if I can find a way to while visiting these same the same sites that we visited. No, no, that's too far. It's too far, okay. Right, okay. <clears throat> and all of this led us to speculate that many Japanese may be a bit like secular American Jews, me for example, who celebrate Passover and Hanukkah as cultural events, but don't observe the more deeply religious Jewish holidays, or perhaps lapsed Catholics like Therese, who nevertheless celebrate Christmas and Easter, again, more as cultural touchstones than as articles of religious faith. And uh, way at the end of this, oh, there we are, mm -hmm. very good. Or like our syncretized Judeo-Christian family who found transcendent beauty in our remarkable trip to Japan. So thank you for letting us share with this with you. And as the Japanese say, arigato. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you. About 10 minutes for questions or comments from people who've been to Japan or people who haven't been. And, 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 and we're not Japanese experts, so we might call on people who've been to Japan to help answer questions. Yes. What was the altitude that you went up to when you were hiking? No idea. No idea. The, the, we, I, we, I went fast, very fast through the, the other hike we did, which was a pilgrimage, where we went up actually quite high, but I, I actually don't know. I don't know. What time of year? Was May, June. I mean, May, May, April. May, May. March, April. March, April. <laughs> middle of March to middle of April. Ah, so yeah. we, we just went, just this past spring. Yeah. So and we literally just followed the cherry blossoms through Japan. Didn't tend to do that, but that's what happened. The, the, the hike that we cut out was the, uh, the Shinto Shrine hike on, on the Key Peninsula. And that was very hard, and we did only a small part of it. We did less than we were we, we, Less than we thought so. we were going to do because it was so hard. Yeah. What was the day of the snowfall? It was, it was toward the end of our trip. It, it was, was in April. April. It was in April. <clears throat> there, there, there are some, I mean, it's mountainous. Yeah. So they get mountain snow in April and May. Yeah, so do we. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. But, but we don't generally walk through it. It's, <laughs> we weren't planning, we weren't planning to walk. Usually appropriate footwear. With snowshoes, yeah, we didn't have snowshoes. I didn't even have boots. Yes. Did you run into 
the Japanese game go anywhere in any indication of it? Like if there were, we didn't Japanese. notice it. You know, th there were a lot of Japanese um, uh, games, and, 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 I, and we never even saw karaoke or um, sumo wrestling. So right. we, we were mostly on a cultural hunt, not a... Not a yeah. And it could have been happening around us, and we just didn't even know. <clears throat> Yes. I'm going to go in March. Can you recommend me reading? Uh, uh, recommend reading? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, after <clears throat> which we can recommend something to you. Yeah, right? yeah. But, but there's a lot of stuff to, for people to look at on their way out yeah. here, yeah. and we'd be glad to lend you things. Right. Harris. Yeah, having been in Japan four years, I think you did an excellent job. Well, thank you. Presenting a lot of things. Huh. The only thing that got under me was the phrase, finally, despite Jap Japanese lost two decades, this 20 year of stagnation, I was there during that period. I want to be stagnant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, okay, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Japan is a country that doesn't feel like they have to have a 3% growth every year. What they care about is that everyone in their country has what they need. Wow. I agree. Wow. I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Bill? It's, it's, it's not inexpensive, but it is not prohibitively expensive. Like, you hear the story, like, $40 for a melon? No, no, no. It's not like that at all. I mean, it was not an inexpensive trip, I will tell you that. I mean, but it wasn't like going to Central America. Um, but it was affordable. I mean... Yeah, I mean, we, we, it was a little more expensive for us because we were a little bit intimidated by the trains and so forth. And so we had part of it planned for us by... Uh, by a travel uh, uh, organization. group organization, yeah. we were we didn't do any tours. We were on our own, but I will say this: Look, it's a little bit like New York City, right? New York City, you can go and you can spend a fortune. If you know where to go, you cannot spend a fortune and have a perfectly good time. You can pay five dollars for a bottle of water or fifty cents, depending on where you go. It, it was like that when we were in Tokyo. We 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 spent. Very little money in Tokyo. Actually, our, our hotel in Tokyo was extremely affordable. It was a, it, and um, it was a, a. It was an apartment. It was an apartment, and you know we didn't eat expensive restaurants. There. We ate a lot of street food. You know, you can you can definitely. When, do it when we were with our son-in-law, <laughs> <laughs> he took us to some very fancy, very expensive restaurants. Right, right. He likes to do that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> some of your slides towards the beginning, there were living trees that had like a post up the center and the streamers come down. Are they training trees to go up there? Or are they cell towers inside trees? No, well, they could. They do have a fantastic cell co phone coverage. They don't have any shortage of, uh, of, of uh, But it, it looked like Christmas trees. So I'm, not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, what. I, I, honestly, I don't think I wouldn't have taken a picture of that. I, those were well, real trees. Oh, oh, I know what you mean. In, 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 in Takayama. No, no. Those were uh, you know, Douglas firs. Yeah. Those were huge, several hundred year old trees. Yeah. But are they training? No. To go up there, I, I, I don't no. think so. What are those things? No. Think so. No. Yeah. Natural. Yeah. No, it, it was natural. No, well, there are man made things on top of uh, oh, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I missed that. I, I, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I can look, we can look at afterwards. Harris. Did you observe uh, male-female relationships where the male was pretty superior and the woman was pretty no. superior? We, we really didn't. We only observed one relationship, and that was Taka and her husband, which was an extraordinary relationship. It was an arranged marriage. And, um, sh and, and in fact, um, they, he, had, he had to provide paperwork because they were from Hiroshima that he was not in Hiroshima at the time of the bombing because back then they didn't want people to, you know, because they were worried about fertility. Turned out he was, but they lied. Mm -hmm. But it was an arranged marriage between his family, their families, and it was just this remarkably respectful, loving uh, couple. I mean, I, I, and, that, and, and I did not see in any, you know, male superiority with him, but that was the only couple that's, we really got right. to know. That's where, that was really shocking to us, Yeah, the, 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 the treatment, yeah. especially yeah. older yeah. women and the superiority. 
yeah I mean, we I just didn't observe it i mean it. you know by the way there were a lot of things we didn't observe that we read about right. like public drunkenness right. the only place we saw public drunkenness was at the ball game right. and that was because this, that was because this one guy was sitting right near us this this one of the eureka girls kept going by to him, <laughs> and every time she did that he would get another beer it was unbelievable <laughs> uh, I observed that too often. there was somebody over here had a question huh Yes. I had a, a comment. Yeah. I, I just wanted to let people know about Matsuri, which happens every other year at St. Mike's. It's a, uh, put on by the Japan <coughs> Society of Vermont. And it's a, uh, Harris is a frequenter of it, right? It's a, a day long thing where you can eat Japanese food, you can have someone dress you in a kimono, you can watch taiko drumming, you can watch um, uh, exhibitions of um, Aikido. It's like an all huh. Japanese. Is it this year, 2020? I'm not sure. It's every other year. I'm not it's sure. It's every other year. And I'm not the, sure. I know the drummers are here right now yeah, in Vermont. It happens, in, um, it happens in March. Yeah. But by the way, speaking of which, I don't know if any of you go to Florida at all um, in the winter, but in Boca Raton is an incredible Japanese garden that shows all the different styles of Japanese garden that we didn't have time to tell you about. and. Um, and also has th that festival um, and does a tea ceremony and, and so forth. Incredibly worth going to. D cre created by a Japanese American man who came, uh, a Japanese man who came to uh, Florida to start a pineapple farming uh, just prior to World War I. Did I see another hand over here? Oh, good. We have a couple minutes. Yeah, it's a Harris. Japanese garden in Vermont down in, oh, I don't even know if I went down there. It's in the brand new state park. Hubbardton. Yeah, brand new state park. Next, next to the Hubbardton Battlefield. Yeah. It's <coughs> the um, uh, Mount Ramble. I'm trying to think of the name. Uh, uh, it's the southern Vermont mountains. Taconic. Yeah, Taconic Mountain Ramble State Park. Okay. Maintains a Japanese garden. Great, great. Yeah, you know, I mean, Japanese gardens, I mean, if you want to go someplace and be peaceful and calm and meditate and be one with nature, they, they just, every one of them is designed in a, in a way to, to touch you and nature. Yes. Do you see much uh, uh, gaijin going bicycling? I've, I've been seeing a lot of NHK videos recently. Um, they're promoting the hell out of uh, uh, packages of, of bicyclists for uh, gaijin, you know, foreigners. Um, and I saw, well, let's see. Did you we see that? We, we would have seen it in Tokyo if we saw it. You, I wouldn't bicycle in Kyoto if my life had it. It's so crowded. Oh, no, not the cities. I meant this was uh, you know, in the mountain, mountain area. Yeah, yeah. see, so here's the thing. We, we in, the, in the mountainous areas, we were hiking in places that you could not go no on a bicycle. No. I mean, it, uh, if, if the, if the uh, people from the Edo area couldn't go on horses, believe me, you couldn't go on bicycle. Well, and also, or it just it was too holy a place to do that. Yeah, so yeah. We just didn't. We didn't see it. No, I mean, I'm not saying it didn't happen. But we didn't see it. No. I mean, J Japan. You could spend a long time in Japan, and you know, if you wanted to see everything, you'd have to spend months and months. Or years. Okay. Yeah. And also, I have to say, we actually saw not that many Western travelers where we went. I mean, Hiroshima is where the first time we saw Americans, and um, when we were in the Kamado Koto, which. <coughs> we didn't get a chance to show you, which is the pilgrimage mountainous hike. There were backpacking Australians and some Americans. I mean, we mostly saw Chinese tourists, if we saw any tourists at all. Yeah, if people have been traveling abroad lately, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something a little, I'm not gonna say it? Okay. <laughs> Do you remember when there used to be ugly Americans touring around um, uh, Europe and so forth? They're ugly Chinese now. Yeah, the Chinese are the, are the difficult travelers now. They, yeah. they really are a handful. Mm -hmm. And we saw, mo most of the tourists we saw were Chinese. Hush my mouth. Well, uh, yes, Bill. Uh, there's a real distinction between the cities and the country that you got. So in the cities, is everybody on a cell phone like they are over here? Yeah. You see a lot of technology yes. in the upper center? Yeah. Yes. 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 Absolutely. But, but, but by the way, uh, to, to, to Harris's point from b before, th there is not a place in Japan 
that you cannot get cell phone coverage. There's not a place in Japan you cannot get a, a internet, internet connection. They make sure that everybody has what they need. Although, uh, let, me, let me say this, is that it, it doesn't have the Wi-Fi culture that we have. So, you know, you, you can't just like walk into a cafe and get on Wi-Fi. Um, so what we ended up, but what we ended up doing was renting a Wi-Fi device and then which connected to the cell towers. And so we had, so we had Wi-Fi everywhere we went so that we didn't have to pay for international phone. Just a comment on the rigid customs. I mean, I noticed when I was there as a, as a clueless teenager that they, they treated, they were incredibly tolerant of their little kids. And the little kids were holy terrorists. And, and they were also very tolerant of, of clueless American teenagers. And they, they are very, to they're they a very to tolerant people, honestly. Yeah, they are. But unless, you, you reach a certain point where, they, where you, you, you have to adhere to their customs. Right. But once they get to junior high or university. Oh, right, then that's it. <coughs> right, so right. They have the high expectations as well. Well, well one of the things that I observed. Um, is um, that th there's basically, p Japanese people basically have a uniform for life. So they wear uniforms as children in their schools, and then they, when they go to work, you only see people in dark suits. I mean, no color, I mean, gray would be considered probably, you know, radical to wear a gray suit versus a black suit. And so I just all of a sudden realized one day, sort of seeing the salary men and women in the street in their suits, and then seeing the school children in their uniforms, that Oh my God, these people just wear uniforms for their entire lives. I mean, that's what it felt like to me. It was a little depressing, I have to say. And what I also noticed is that when the Japanese people are at leisure, I mean, they're obviously not wearing suits, but they don't wear bright colors. You know, they wear muted colors. If you see an Asian person with bright colors, they're Chinese. They're Chinese, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nancy. I just wanted to also comment that, um, that we have a, a, a mini Japan experience 14 miles from here in the um, example of Shaoshan, which oh, is right. a mm -hmm. Zen temple in Woodbury right. that welcomes visitors. And you can see, you know, you get a com complete aesthetic experience with the way they maintain the grounds and the architecture of the building and the way the priests dress and the food that's served. Mm -hmm. and everything Japanese. Well, it's Zen specifically. It's, it's Zen specifically. It's and one of the really surprising things to me about being in Japan I wasn't prepared for is how little Zen presence there is in Japan. That is not the dom predominant Japanese practice. It's pure land Buddhism or true pure land Buddhism, I think it's called. That's um, the, the, the dominant. And, and, the, and the Zen temples are just closing. It's I was. I wasn't expecting so, that. So the Buddhism is much. It's very. This very inflected with Shintoism. Right. Very bright and orange and, yeah. and joyous. The Zen priests in Japan do feel that America is carrying on a tradition, the mm -hmm. U.S., mm -hmm. because it is dying. Yeah. 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 Okay. One more question, and then we probably should wrap up here. Yeah. Let's wrap up here. Okay. Thank okay. You.